it's Monday on Your View. Welcome to the show. I am Morayo Afolabi Brown. As always, I have the ladies with me. Hello, Nima Akasha. Good morning. How are you doing today? I'm fine. I'm grateful to God for family, for life, and for um, our trials as well. Mm. We learn from them. It's all part of life. It's all part yeah. of life. Yes, That's, that completes life. I was speaking yesterday at um, an event organized by a group, a Nasia group. Mm. And I just thought about, you know, my reflections and seriously, we, we don't look like what we've been through. And if we sit in retrospect, a, more, a lot more would be grateful. grateful and happy no matter what mm -hmm. we do. Mm -hmm. People say that a lot that hmm, if, if half the world goes through what we go through, mm. they would, they, half of them would have totally uh, given, up. given up on that. Mm. Because we, uh, Nigerians as a people, we're very resilient in a lot of mm -hmm. things that we yes. so, yeah. How are you doing, Topway? I'm good. Grateful to God for joining me. So Travel the I haven't weekend. been to I haven't been to Benin. The, I haven't been to the um, um, the farm in a long time. Yes. So and the kids were on meet them. So after we came back from BC's place, the next day we went to Ibadan. Mm -hmm. I wanted to give. I have two, two things I want to share. But one, I want to I want to applaud the team implementing keeping the trailers of Ogiri. So Ogiri is a popular trailer park. Mm -hmm. Like it's, the entire place is always jam packed with trailers parking on the road. Whatever it is, there's a new policy that says no trailer should be on the road, and the people that are implementing it are doing a good job. So I appreciate all the tanker drivers, trailer drivers that are complying, mm -hmm. but I also appreciate those that are implementing because that's the problem we have with um, in Apapa. Nobody is able to drive the compliance of the laws established to provide peace to the road, right. and they were able to achieve it in Ogiri. So thumbs up to those doing that. There's improvement on the road. Um, work is going on. We're hoping that they will finally finish this job. It's been over 10 years of doing Lagos Ibadan Expressway. Can we please just finish it? But let me just share this tip. I heard something yesterday that really, really blessed me. For every time you get money, you are getting bread and seed. Don't eat the entire income as bread. Mm. Ensure that you respect <laughs> the principles of keeping your seed while eating your bread. Many of us end up eating the entire thing like it's bread without keeping a seed and we are unable to replicate the successes of the future. Mm. Thank you. I always also say, do not eat with your two hands. <laughs> eat with one hand. Keep small. Keep small. Mm. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. It's your case. Uh, Speak it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, this weekend, um, my son's classmate had a party, so he mm. was invited. He was turning 10. Mm. I went there. There were moms around. We had fun. I danced. Ah, <laughs> I danced. Like, I need, I need to be having parties regularly. I love mm. to dance. I'm a dancer, naturally. So, so every opportunity that I get to move my body and just move to the music. And when I started, some moms were looking at me like, ah, she's Your not even shy. Macho. No, she, the, 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 everybody just sat down, they were for me. Me, I stood up, I danced. After <laughs> I, eating, I danced very well. After a few uh, minutes, some people joined me and we had, we had a good time. My son had a good time. Mm. And then Oga came, picked us up and went to see um, a movie in the cinema. It was just mm. a family weekend, nice. really. Nice, nice. <laughs> I try to remember uh, what you, you did. Do it. I could see what I was doing. What I rules to try to remember. <laughs> what was I doing? I Saturday, Saturday, I had a shoot, interestingly, you know, and uh, I think that was it. And then it was all. A photo I, shoot? It, it's nine no, 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 just laying down. Okay. Couldn't, okay. Nobody could access anything for mm. like a whole I think it was video was really bad. was bad on Saturday. Mm. No, was... Sunday, I was on the road, you know. So, I mean, I mean, it's so good. I mean, mm. I like the family. Maybe, you know, I just found out that Christmas is on a Saturday this year. Yes, it's a new year. Oh, let's yes. do a party. Let's plan 25th. Yeah. Yeah. So let's do I, something, I right? Plan, you, you know, I see any party is always on the 25th. Oh, that's the 25th. Like it's on the 25th. Talk about 25th, gone, gone, gone. Okay. Christmas Oh, let's do Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's plan a party. Let's see how that works. We're not working. Yeah. Usually Christmas yes, is Yes, we're in the yeah. studio. Please. We're not working. But I'll be waiting until 2021. So, is that why the producer said you people are not going to be yeah. on the show on yeah. Christmas, Christmas Day? And I thought they did something. To, they uh, did us a favor. Uh, we're oh, always here on Christmas Day. Oh, it's Saturday. Saturday. Yeah. Well, thank God. <laughs> people don't they understand the sacrifice. Yeah. They're here on Christmas Day. So, January January this year will be with the next year will be with our family. Yes, I'm so excited. Okay, it's Monday. So much happening in Lagos. Let's go on a break. When we come back, we go through the front pages of the papers. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Your view will be right back. Okay. We're starting with the nation. Saludo coasting to victory. Two abducted Baptist worshippers shot dead. And three hospitalized. 
rice smuggling on the rise. Tier 1 bank's assets hit 46 trillion naira. Drug dealer behind multiple UK-bound consignment in NDLA net right now. How Nigeria can be greater by Adeboye. Ikoi building victims families besiege IDH. Pantami Asu Pro panel plays Puto. Okay, let's start with the major headlines. Soludo. So the candidate of the All Progressive Grand Alliance, Professor Charles Soludo, is set to be declared the winner of uh, Saturday's Anambra State governorship elections. As the results so far released really said, he won 18 out of 20 local governments. So they said um, there were some local government that were not able to carry out their elections. Uh, Ihiala and Urumba, they had, you know, claimed that uh, there were mutilation of figures, there, were, uh, there was violence, threats to life, failure of the voter accreditation system. But they are going to be running a supplementary uh, election, okay. and by then we will now know who exactly is the winner. Uh, so uh, results for Idemili South local government could also not be announced as a result of dispute between, as I said, the returning officer and supervising of polling officer, they had issues. So by the time all of this is resolved, we'll know exactly who is the winner. But mm. there are some figures there. I don't know if you look yeah, at Yeah, so it. it's clear. I mean, I mean, he's coasting to victory, as yeah, he said. It is. Uh, so there's a possibility he'll be announced as soon as INEC um, reverses yeah. their... Yeah, in OSM. He came out with a post now saying, come yeah. to thank you, well, Anambra. He commend the conduct of the election. The Anambra Later, yeah. We have to run, yeah, but, but I mean, generally, it was a, it was a good election. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's take another story. Uh, yes, I was going to take the key, um, on the 31st of October, 66 worshippers were abducted from the Baptist, um, Emmanuel Baptist Church in Kakodadi, Kaduna State. Of those 66, five were shot, two died, mm. um, three are critically injured, and the threat was that. These people, these this kidnappers have said that until they are invited to a round table with the government, they will not be releasing these people that were adopted and they will continue to kill more people ongoing. So um, the Reverend, uh, Reverend Akonji has said that he's, we are not government, the church is not government, the church is not even in talks with the government, the president is still not around, mm. he's on a trip. So the killing of two and now terribly injuring three is not going to solve the problem that they should please help, um, whoever has contact with the um, bandits should help appeal to them to please not kill more people while they're trying to find a peaceful resolution of the issue. Okay. Uh... So the NDLA, um, yes, yeah, so they've, um, according to their spokesperson, Femi Baba Femi, they've caught one, who call it Collins Ikena, who's supposed to be responsible for the uh, cannabis concealed in black soap packs that were labeled as... Um, Judo show that was, you know, recovered at the airport. And he is already, he was already, according to them, arrested in November and arraigned before a court for another uh, attempt at exporting about 15 kg of meth. 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 Just meth. meth. Yeah, just so meth. <laughs> Before I bite my tongue. And um, I just let's to, com to commend them because when this report came out about the Judo show uh, conceal mm -hmm. uh, consignment, we were wondering why, you know, they don't get the person. So mm. but now they've got him and obviously since he's already a, a, a suspect on that trial, this should go smoothly. So Pastor Adebwe mm -hmm. was saying during the um, Holy Ghost on Friday that those who are jostling for the 2023 don't even know if tomorrow is promised to them. So mm -hmm. we can't keep um, planning that people are coming to ask him <laughs> that who, do, who doesn't think should be president, what's going to happen. He's saying, do you even think that there will be in Nigeria by 2023? Mm -hmm. like, he, he hopes there will be. Mm -hmm. He's just saying that, <laughs> listen, you don't know tomorrow. That yeah. is, maybe it's too early. I think he's trying to say it's it, 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 in a nutshell that it's kind of too early for anybody. Tomorrow is not promised to anybody. And mm -hmm. so it's too early to start thinking about 2023. No, I don't That's think it's much. too early. So, um, I another story in the punch. Oh, punch, yeah, go ahead. Punch. I thought it was Nation. Uh, Let's take a few yeah, stories. Oh, you have a punch. We have a punch. I was moving on to the punch. I was just moving on. Okay, let's move on to the punch. Anambra Gubo Post, Soludo said to win leads 17 local government APC alleges Regan. 
Um, 43 year old man arrested for beating daughter to death over persistent crying. Mm -hmm. mm. mm. Nigerians with missing vaccination card need affidavit and police report. We trekked for hours, federal government, uh, fed like slaves, says Uni Abuja kidnapped <coughs> victims. Finally, they were released. Salami reports Magu on half pay 16 months after suspension. VC mounts defense as PDP carpets on do over varsity fee hike. FG meets customs as 566,000 metric tons of India, Thailand, uh, rice arrive in the Republic. Politicians asking for 2023, I um, uncertain future says at Dibway. And building collapse Lagos because zero conviction as 213 die in seven years. Okay. So, yes. this, so the National Primary Healthcare Development Agency has published that Nigerians with a missing um, COVID-19 vaccination cards would have to provide affidavit and police reports for them to get it back. So they said, if you know that yours is missing, you know, this came as a result of the uh, rule that was given to all public servants that when you are about to enter public offices, they would ask you to provide your vaccination card. So if it's missing, you have to go back to the first center where you took your uh, first dose. You give them the name, your name, your surname, uh, probably the dates of the days you took the vaccination. And if they check through uh, their system and they find your information, then they will give you another card. But that must be done for you to get another card. Okay. All so right. the first three-year-old man who, um, according to him, mistakenly beat his daughter to death, Mm. Um, according to the report, the state's commissioner for women affairs, children and social welfare, Olubukola um, Olabokbo, in a statement, um, said that this was three-year-old man was reported to them as have, um, having beaten his child to death and buried the child. And so they went mm. and reported, had, had arrested him and handed him over to the police. He then confessed that his child, the child was left with him. The child was crying too loudly. Something oh, came over yeah. him, and he beat the two-month-old child to death. But the wife's account wasn't the horror of this. She said that they had five children in total. And due to poverty, they had killed and buried... Um, um, they had killed or they yes, lost? They, 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 they had killed two of them. Wow. They left one around the technical school area, and then this one again was killed by her husband and they buried the child in their it farm. It was a mental oh issue. No, yes. no, this is beyond mental issue. The two of them cannot be mental at the same time. Oh, you can ah. be the okay. wife is not pained by the loss of five children. <laughs> the husband is, you know. But thankfully, he's been arrested. And there was cases where they will be sending their children. But this is one of the um, examples of the end time mm. in the Quran. Extreme. People <laughs> kill their own children out of hunger. Oh, my God's goodness. God's protect oh, God. all of us. Papa, take story? Yes, I was going to take the story of... Um, the uni Abuja kidnapping. So, thankfully, they've been released and there was no loss of life. But their account was of horror. Mm. Said they were fed like slaves. They walked for hours. That the first day they drank Gary with dirty water. Mm. And that the second day, the kidnappers um, harvested yam from other people's farms and roasted it for them to eat. That the, um, one of the the person narrating said he has never walked that trek that much in his life. And when he was falling down, they had, his son had to hold him because they were like, they're going to shoot him if he doesn't walk anymore. Mm. Remember that asked for 300 million naira in, as a um, mm. ransom fee. And when they realized that they were not going to get that money, they now decided to say they should do even a prisoner swap. Mm. So that we don't know, but they said they were rescued. According to the witness, the people that survived this ordeal, they said they were released at two um, 2 a.m. and they started working out. But with what was um, um, 2 a.m. on Friday, they were released that um, to go out and they had to walk out of that place. It was a terrible experience for them. I'm just grateful to God that we did not lose anyone in mm. that um, Uni Abuja kidnapping. And I pray that the question mm. they've asked, which is that they should build the fences and do other things to secure the university um, staff quarters, be done so that we prevent this from real this from just that one. I mean, the likelihood of going to request the same place is, is slim, but across the nation, mm. certainly, yeah. they, have to, they have to secure these children. Okay, let me go on a quick break now. When we come back, we continue with the review. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Your view will be right back. Thanks for staying with us. Moving on now to the point. Despite aggressive revenue drive, Nigeria recalls 3.48 trillion naira fiscal deficit.
Grand Cross Congresses and Greek APC leaders spoil for war. Cracks widen nationwide. Brother breaks sister's head over missing egg. How was Shibono's mega dream extinguished his promising life? Politics of assault on Nigerian judiciary. Nigerians were deceived to believe that PDP was their problem in 2020, 2015, says Olobudion. Okay, I have the major headline. Uh, I mean, this is from the, the, I think, the Minister of Finance. So they were saying that um, Nigeria records about 3.48 fiscal deficit. Now, what that means is that the amount of money we're expecting to hit, we're spending more mm, than we're, we're making, you know, and so and they, to to offset this amount, they've been trying to borrow from domestically, and that's also a problem. Mm. So um, it, the, the article didn't really tell us exactly how we're going to solve this problem, but obviously we need to find conventional, non-conventional ways to generate revenue. I think mm. that's that's pretty much the only way we can solve this problem. But we are we are actually spending much more than we are generating, and that in itself is a problem. I know. I think some, sometimes we this this uh, space up in a lot of aggression because. Nima took a story of um, a poor family killing a child very wrong. Another funny story took place, um, reported in the points, of a brother breaking the head of his sister over missing egg or stolen mm. egg. According to the sister, um, accused the brother, Chubike, of stealing uh, like egg, a, a, a head laid egg. It got stolen. Simple <laughs> egg matter. It became a fight that resulted in her head getting broken. Because the um, brother, elder brother, 28-year-old, um, 28 took a wood and hit her on the head. Yes. And she now said, they've always had these issues of, you steal my things, you take my food without permission. They live in the same house. Wow. They've been, siblings. And they're siblings. At they've 28. Been, they've been taken to court. The man pled not guilty to any of the crimes, said that, yes, we fought each other, but I did not hit her head. I think she fell down and hit her head somewhere. And I did not steal the egg either. Um, the the point is that this this issue, this ah. big mega issue, mm. is trickling down. 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 Little things, little things, little things to just down. inflame people. Yeah. Little things, just, and we read the story and are wondering what's going on. Well, on the larger scale, there's a huge poverty um, increase. There's a huge economical deficit. People are poor. People and are this, angry. People are angry. Yeah. And things like this will continue so, to happen. Uh, this, there's yeah. also the part of unfinished uh, investigation. So the magistrate courts that granted the search warrants. With which, um, with which the agency, now that we don't know, because the SEC says it's not them, um, went to search the uh, residence of the um, judge of, uh, of the Supreme Court, justice of the Supreme Court, as we, we retracted that, um, revoked that warrant that she, the court granted. The court is saying that they were misled because according to, the, to, the, to this report in the point, <laughs> one Aliu Ibrahim, was supposedly a whistleblower. He swore to an affidavit on October 13th saying that he's noticed some illegal activities around the residence mm. of the Chief Justice. And they, based on that, they got a search warrant that was granted to one Lawrence Ajodo, a Chief Superintendent of Police and a member of the investigation team under the Asset Tax Recovery Panel of the Ministry of Justice. And so they went to that address. But the address on the search warrant was number seven, Imo River Street, Meitama. Mm -hmm. And the address of the chief justice was number nine, Imo Street, Meitama. How this led to them and they took into into uh, yes. Oh. The address number seven to, to raid number, number nine. nine. Imo River Street, Metama is different from Imo Street. Mm. Uh -huh. Number seven is different from number, number nine. nine. Mm. But then they went there and, you know, so the chief judge, the uh, magistrate has revoked the search warrant on the grounds of the court being misled. Mm. But they have searched already. This huh. is either... This, this to me, is... Um, yes. Yeah. And it's, you can find out. There are names to this. Mm. You can investigate it because, of course, the sacredness of the judiciary mm. should be protected. Yeah. These are people who must be seen to be unbiased in their judgment. Yeah. And you have people who want to take out some grievances. If you don't protect, protect them, this can mm. happen. Mm. Yeah. Let me quickly add that judges. because the story is here so you don't just call it again. So the Niger Delta former agitators are calling on the federal government to investigate this recent siege to uh, Justice Mary Peter Odili, saying that um, um, you can't just come out and say they are incriminating activities. You have to answer some questions. They, sh mm -hmm. sh they should not sweep the matter under the carpet. They are going to answer why are they having this sort of investigation right now? Uh, what are the incriminating uh, illegal activities that 
had uh, happening in that apartment and why, who ordered that invasion? They are going to mm -hmm. be answering this question. Who is Ali and they Ibrahim? see it as who's a who's ploy who's? to intimidate, harass, and probably force her out of office. According to them, uh, her current position in the Supreme Court, she's just next after the incumbent. Yes. And uh, they she feel judged. it's a ploy to, next you to know, like... intimidate her out of office. Okay, moving quickly now to Daily Sun. FG moves to stop cross-border rice importation. Ijo Youth ex-militants roar. Serap wants court to stop Buhari from spending 26 billion naira on travels and meals. IPOP repels headsman attack in Enugu community. Nigeria needs peace at home and respect abroad to make progress, says Ayim. An NDLA nabs drug dealer behind London-bound multiple consignments. An Ambras Toludo ex-CBN governor in landslide victory. Okay, which story is taking? <coughs> Rice. The Director General of Rice Producers Association of Nigeria, Andy Ekwelem, has released a document that shows that 566,000 metric tons of rice from India and Thailand were heading to Benin Republic, our neighboring community. And of course, because you know, the population is not there. Mm. The population is here. They are also decrying the level of smuggling of this product into the country and asking the federal government to do something about it. The Minister for Agriculture and Rural Development, Mahmoud Abubakar, said that, you know, there is a said steering committee on national tax force on the illegal importation of rice through our land borders and they're doing everything possible. They've also, uh, you know, they're meeting with customs to stem the porosity of our borders and the way these rice are smuggled. They're doing mm. their best on this. Right. But of course, according to the rice producers, this affects local production and sale because people prefer to consume the foreign, foreign rice, rice anyway. So mm. they should do much more. If we're diverting the diversification of the economy, let's do it well. If, mm. we, if we must do it at all. And it's, but it's not easy because my till date, my husband also complains that why are we not buying the imported? Like it's different when you cook it. It does not come out nice in jollof rice. We must adapt our taste to, to get satisfied with our local local production. local production because it really affects. And this is our Christmas rice or the Christmas rice that. Yeah, but the price mm -hmm. difference between the foreign rice and the Nigerian rice now is not is not significant it's not for much. people not to want to buy the foreign rice. Mm. So you know that when you uh, get the foreign rice, your fried rice, your jollof rice will come you out come well. On, Why right? do I want to just remove two k or three k to buy the local one that will stress me? Because you want to mm. help our economy. But the local one. No, but I've been eating, you know, well. I've been eating the local rice. So I'm yeah. an advocate, mm. but <laughs> sometimes they. Uh, no, no, not <laughs> I'm not a patriot. So to support the drive to reduce the cost of governance, Serap has actually taken the federal government to court. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're saying that they need to stop the president from uh, budgeting for local and foreign travels, meals, refreshments, sitting allowance, welfare mm -hmm. package, and office building. Mm -hmm. According to them, they are, say, they are seeking an order of mandamus to direct and compel the president to public spending details on the State House Medical Center since 2019, so since uh, May 2015, to date and to redirect some of the monitor on travels and meals, improve public health care and facilities across the country. So, Serap is doing their work, of course. Um, they, they, they really, happy. really. Mm. But and I just we need to have more engagement at this level where non partisan civil um, groups would, would check what is going on and uh, follow the rule of law. But what Serap is doing, yeah. a, a, a common sense thinking will show that the government shouldn't be. By cut our shop compelled to do this. Mm. We are already shouting, we are spending we so much. Enough. We have such billion. deficits. We are owing, we are doing, you know, <coughs> and Common sense for that. But it goes back to it. There are lots of people in mm. yeah. if, if you look at the numbers, mm. then we, is that that we reduce the numbers? Instead of we having this by camera, we should have the camera. Since Michel Obama released that issue. book, it became very, since Michelle Obama released the book mm. that presidents in the U.S., in the White House, pay, pay for, for their, their own food. food. Yeah. Since that time, eh, I, I don't want any politician to be eat, using our, our funds that is not enough to be buying mm. themselves, to be cooking a uh, huge um, mm. dinner. and they, they should pay. The one you can afford to eat if you're not president is what you should eat when you become president. Mm. It's also a matter of priority. Yes. 26 billion for travels, food, uh. allowances and all that. Well, 19.17 billion is going to be allocated to all the teaching hospitals, Unilac teaching hospitals, uh, uh, hospital Ibadan, a teaching hospital, and other teaching hospitals and university colleges, less than what we want to use to eat food uh -uh. and travel. It's a matter of priority. We exactly. need to say it so, out. So, um, Pius, um, former Senate President Pius Ayim, I mean, Ayim Pius Ayim, mm -hmm. was given the leadership, um, he got the award Zix Prize for leadership, and mm. 
what he said was, for Nigeria to survive and thrive, we must have peace at home mm -hmm. and respect abroad. Mm -hmm. And for this to happen, we need leaders that connect and engage with people, especially the youth. He mentioned how over the next 25 years, most of our oil um, exploration companies and oil companies are going to phase out. And we need to actively create the new industry 4.0, which is going to rely on the young people. Mm -hmm. uh, I so. Well, talking about Zeke's Prize, Governor Samuelu also won the, the year 2020 Zeke Prize for Good Governance. Mm -hmm. So congratulations to congratulations the Governor of the State. Yeah. Yeah. Governor yeah. I saw it in his post this morning. Mm -hmm. So all done to that. Okay, moving on to the Vanguard. Let's find a story we have not taken. How two schoolgirls kidnapped in Ugun escaped to Oyo. Don't mm. sweep invasion of justice or the least house on the carpet, said Niger Delta agitators. Restructure will end bad leadership in Nigeria's <coughs> Arewa youths. Military intervention not enough to solve security challenges, says U.S. consulates and others. We have lost 800 teachers in the Northeast, says NUT. Uh, PDP will explore other funding sources, says AYU. Varsity fees, Undo PDP parents tackle a career over the 120,000 <coughs> hike. And Ikoyi building collapse, rescue operations, 99% complete, death toll hits 44. Okay. So two the, school, okay. The two school girls kidnapped um, one 18 year old Zaina Brafio and one 16 year old Kendi Adiogo said that they were kidnapped at the um, Agbado crossing. As they're on the railway line in Agbado area of Lagos or Ugo State because it's a border town. And then they were stopped by a car with men with uh, AK rifles, ordered them to get in the car. Mm. And before they knew it, they, did, they found themselves <coughs> somewhere in Oyo. They were tied to trees, separate trees. One of them was strong enough to chew her way out wow. of the rope that Jesus they were used to tie them, uh, that they used to tie them and rescue, free uh, the other, decided to run. They ran into a major road and asked around, and they found that they were already in Oyo. Ah. Mm. So the girl, one of the, they were smart enough, met a food seller by the road, asked for phones, called their family members. One of them was able to call her dad, who called a relative to pick them up. They were taken to wow. the Alafi's palace, mm. and then from there, the Alafi called the DSS <clears throat> into the matter. They were rescued and handed over to family members again. Ah. This is just another um, case of sad story. sad story, but we're grateful to God. So yes. everybody now, we are helping ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're lucky to be able mm -hmm. to help. Okay, let's take a few more stories. The Arewa Youth Consultative Forum has said that it's only a restructuring that will save Nigeria, and they will not be supporting any candidates coming out for the 2023 elections who is over 50 years old. They're saying that um, the federal government should also uh, give a referendum to people, uh, secessionist groups, to see how popular it is. By the time you give them a referendum, they will test their, the popularity of their idea and how many people that want to go with them. And if it's quite popular and they really want to go, they should allow them to go peacefully. But at this coming election, they will only stand behind uh, uh, people who they know or be committed to good governance. So they are not going to pitch tents with any old politician, basically. Mm. Yeah. Please, I want to quickly take the story of teachers. Um, the NUT, the Nigerian Uni Union of Teachers, um, have said that they've lost 800, mm. um, 800 teachers to insecurity. Not mm. necessarily that they died, but that some of them, a lot of them were kidnapped. That because when they take out, when they come and kidnap the children, some of the teachers will be like, you cannot take my children, I'll follow mm. them. And so a lot of the teachers follow these children into kidnapping and that it is extremely worrisome that the government isn't doing enough to provide security for schools and that they are, the, the threats coming from, not even a threat, the his, his statements coming from the national president of the union, Dr. Nasir Idris, is that if some schools, it's not all local government that are in danger do, these endangered schools where there's prone, uh, people are prone to attacks, if it is not secure, mm. that the union would advise teachers to withdraw their services from those areas mm. and there'll be no more teachers to provide education in those places because they are putting their lives at risk by being there. All right. Okay, that is all we can take on Front Page Review. When we return, move on to an update on the Eco -E Collapse building. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Your view will be right back.
Thanks for staying with us. So last week, Governor Babajide Songwulu inaugurated a six-member panel of inquiry to investigate the cause of the collapse of the 21-story building in Nikoyi, Lagos. On the show today, we have with us the chairman, Nigerian Institute of Town Planners, Lagos State Chapter, Town Planner Ayo Adejimo. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you very much. Good morning. So this is what we know, for, based on what the governor had said, I think by Saturday morning, um, we had about 42 confirmed dead, 15 alive. 49 have filled the missing persons form, and um, search and recovery is still ongoing. And they, the, the governor has also provided um, funds for those to support bearers of those who have passed and also to support those who would need help at least to, to kickstart their life now that their breadwinners may have passed on. But my first question to you, sir, is as a town planner yourself, and I know you've worked with the current chairman of the panel, uh, Mr. Uh, Tony Aindi, who was here mm -hmm. recently, um, what do you think should be the first step as this panel goes out there to, in fact, what, what, what should we, what should they do? What should they, how, how do they start the inquiry? What are the first steps you would say they should do or would you advise? Or what should I just expect from them as they begin to investigate this um, collapse? Thank you very much. Um, you see, let me first uh, commiserate with the people of uh, Lagos State, especially the Lagos State government. Uh, we as a body, we um, feel the uh, unfortunate incident and we want to uh, commiserate with the families of uh, uh, the fatalities and especially the Lagos State government. Uh, the Nigerian Institute of Town Planners, Lagos State Chapter, uh, feels worried uh, about the unfortunate incident. But that, as me, we pray that uh, God will grant the uh, departed uh, peace, uh, rest in peace. Um, going back to your question, uh, let me also state that uh, the members of the committee, the investigative panel, uh, were carefully selected by the governor in his wisdom. Um, they know what to do, and uh, we don't want to prevent. And actually, what uh, they should first do, that I think as a town planner, is to um, which is also one of the uh, assignments of the panel to find out the cause or the causes of the uh, collapse. So uh, as a panel, they will come together to uh, find out basically um, and professionally the, the building that collapsed had an approval, development permits. Yeah. If it asks, what number of floors uh, was, approved. was approved for the building? So these are the technicalities that the committee will look at and find out if actually, I, I know they have an engineer, and I'm very sure that they will also take um, submissions from professional bodies and from individuals to find out if actually the building had uh, a structural defect, because these are some of the remote causes of the, uh, of the collapse. Cause of the collapse building. Okay, so um, please, can you help me understand? So we, um, for such a building, I know that there will be um, a structural engineer in charge. There will be architect, architect, the role of the architect. What's the role of town planning in that um, building? And is there anything, a town, an effective town planning process would could there, could there be anything that could have been done from the town planning perspective <laughs> to prevent such from happening? Yes. Um, as you rightly said, such a project, mm -hmm. and like any other physical development project like that, should have uh, an engineer supervising it. And of course, there will have been an architect that will have designed the building or the mm -hmm. structure. And uh, all professionals in the built industry that have one thing or the other to do with the project have to come in. Uh, let me speak from the uh, point of a town planner, yeah. and uh, as you have asked, it is the um, right of the town planning authority as constituted by the state government, and as it is all over Nigeria, uh, there should be a town planning authority that we uh, <coughs> expected to grant development permits to every physical development, whether it's a, a project of the, of the government, even government itself has to apply 
<clears throat> for development permits from the appropriate town planning authority, mm -hmm. needless to say individual. So every organization, individual, group of people or government has to apply to the town planning authority for the grant of a development permit. Mm. And there are, of course, there are documents that will be requested, mm. that will be required from the developer to submit, which will be uh, assessed before the uh, development permit is granted. And so it is the duty of the town planning office to look at the architectural drawing, look at the structural drawing. Don't forget that in town planning office, it's, only, it's not only town planners that are there. We have the builders, we have the architects, we have the engineers. Mm -hmm. So they all look at that proposal on paper as presented by the developer. So mm -hmm. this is what they will consider after looking at the technicalities mm -hmm. of the uh, right, of let the me, project. Let me go on a break. When I come yes. back, continue with this conversation. Stay with us, Rebecca. Stay tuned. Your view will be right back. to stay with us. So as Nigerians are looking forward to the reports of the panel that was set up by the governor to inquire on what happened at the Ekoyi Collapse Building. We have with us the chairman of the Lagos Town Planner um, Association, Mr. Adejimon, to share further light on what, how this investigation might be carried out. So we have, go ahead, Mr. Yes, yeah, so um, in this sort of inquiry, I would like to know the people, the stakeholders who would be questioned directly in relation to the collapse that has happened. And how easy or difficult do you think this inquiry would be, considering the fact that the owner of the building is dead? At least he may have been able to provide some more information. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, virtually every uh, professional body in the built environment, we are seven in numbers um, that will be involved, that will be asked to uh, make submissions. And of course, um, Members of the public will also be uh, requested to make uh, submissions and uh, other stakeholders uh, that may be involved. The insurance company mm -hmm. can be uh, also invited to make submission. And, and of course, as I said, other members of the public are also uh, qualified to make submission to the panel. So these are the things that the panel will bring together uh, to form their uh, report that will be presented to the government. Right, so do you the, think... Okay, okay, yeah, the second part of the question, now that the owner died, unfortunately... Uh, now that the owner is dead, um, the panel, or let me say the government, uh, knows what to do about that. In the sense that uh, now that he's dead, if he had been alive, he would have been prosecuted, arrested and prosecuted. Uh, but now that he's dead, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's right. very difficult and okay, possible okay, go ahead, to really uh, hold someone responsible. responsible for that. One of the things that impeded rescue on this collapse site was access of food. Some people were saying that it was not wide way. enough for the mm. kind of machines that would assist in rescue. What would the town planning as a group, what role would you have played in such location? Is it okay to have a location where access... An apartment that will have so many... A, a, a uh, building that will have so many apartments and the only access is one narrow road. road. Should that have been approved? I've been to the site. And uh, I, can, I can see that uh, there's an exit at the back. Okay. So it's not only that road that we see now, maybe mm -hmm. on TV, that Leads provides in. access to the site. There's an exit at the back, mm -hmm. which I believe... Uh, will have been the alternative uh, uh, access okay. to the, to so the would, property. People have been suggesting different possibilities. Was it an earth shift? Was it poor materials? Was it negligence? From your own professional angle, what would you think was the cause of this entire collapse? Uh, well, uh, I wouldn't want to say for now, uh, so as not to preempt the uh, investigative planning. Um, but there are a lot of factors that could uh, cause building collapse, um, not really about this uh, subject matter, 
But talking about building collapse generally, there are a lot of, even the two buildings who collapse. Who collapse. Mm. Yes. If um, there's compromise in the building materials used, and of course, uh, if uh, adequate materials are not used, uh, where uh, the construction was supposed to take 20 bags of cement, and the developer or the uh, contractor was trying to manage the resources, and they, they, they decide to use 10. Mm. It may cause mm. the collapse of the building. And even if they have used the best of the material, but if quantity was not enough, so, so how, it could let, let me just, I want to put this thing in proper perspective, because, yes. because you're a town planner. We yes, want to have an idea, because that the, the, the chairman of this panel is a town planner also. He's a president, yeah. national president, Mr. Um, Tony Aindi. So we just want to have an idea what he's thinking, because I know you're not in the committee, you're no, not in the panel. No. But what his approach would be. So you said that they might find out from Alausa if they have the necessary approvals. Let's just yeah. imagine that box is ticked. Mm -hmm. They have all the approvals for 21 mm -hmm. floors. Yes. What else could have gone wrong? Is it just the materials or what could have happened that would cost this? Yes, if, if it had uh, an approval for 21 floors, yes. then the, the colors might have been from structural defect. Mm. Might be from structural defect. Because having an approval for 21 floors uh, did not say that the building should collapse. Mm. I've just said that uh, even a two-floor building can collapse True. if it was not uh, uh, properly constructed. Right. So for the fact that a, a 21 building, there are 25 floor buildings. Around that, the area. Around yes. the area. 30 floor buildings are in Lagos mm -hmm. of 15, 20 years old, mm -hmm. so, and they did not collapse. So building does not collapse on paper. Mm. When town planning authority give... Um, development permit to a, to a, to a structure, the, it is now led for the builders, the architect and the engineers that are in charge of the construction of the building to ensure that the building was properly uh, developed. Mm. Because let me liken it to um, a situation whereby the road safety call gives a driver's license and the driver had an accident and you want to say that he should query the road safety. Mm -hmm. Because the when, when he wanted to get the license, he passed through the test. The test mm. And he passed. And he was granted the license to drive. And if he had an accident, it's not the fault of the road safety. So it is the same thing. When town planning authority uh, grants development permit to develop to a, mm. to, a, to a structure, the building does not collapse on paper, mm. as I said. So. So is it the, the construction, it is the construction that had effect, that had it, a defect. Is it, is it also possible that the, the quality of materials, now I don't mean that mm. there was a, um, you know, cut, cutting of, um, of standards, but yes. if, for instance, someone was discussing with me, there are certain kinds of sand material that are not used for foundational purposes, but mm. they are cheaper. That's the one dredged from the sea directly because of the salt content which can affect rods and all of that. Is it possible that this is, you know, could happen at, a, at such a place? Yes, like, like I said, that uh, not really talking about this. <laughs> no, equal, no, you know. Generally speaking, when the building collapses, these are some of the factors that could lead to it. Mm. When poor materials were used or inadequate materials were used. So you are very correct to say that the materials that were used or a building that collapsed were, were poor or were not up to standard. Yes. yes so so I would like you to, sorry, stop me, to um, help us understand where the job of a town planner starts and ends. So, for instance, you give an approval for a building. Do you just, you know, give that approval and walk away and you don't come back to check? Are there some regular checks that you do to ensure that they are following the rules and guidelines based in the planning that you've gotten license for? Yes, for Lagos State, um, there's an agency that is in charge. So the, the, the job of the town planning authority does not stop at granting of Approval. development permits. Okay. The, it, it is also the responsibility of the town planning authority to monitor what it has approved and see if the developer is not contravening, if the, the developer is building according 
to their do they actually data. monitor? Because they, we've they, seen they, cases they have where a, they have agencies that monitors that. Do they monitor? Yeah. You know what I'm they asking, do. sir? We've seen cases where the building has been completed, and then they come and say this was not in the plan. Mm -hmm. So where were they when those structures were being erected yeah, that was not in the plan? You see, in, in matters like this, there is something that we know that comes in, and that is Nigerian factor. Mm -hmm. You see. A lot of people do a lot of things that call yes, that <laughs> is against the law mm. or the regulations. Mm. In a situation whereby the development permit is granted and people contravene, and in an attempt to ensure that we want to confirm whether what you are building or what you have built is in line, is in line with what was granted, you, you, you find some restrictions. Mm. To the extent that uh, some people even uh, get the support of the police, of the security agencies, mm. to prevent the, the uh, agencies, the staff of the agencies from carrying out their responsibility, as in to monitor what you have developed mm. or what you are developing. Okay, thank you for opening that yeah. can, because we would yes. like to develop on that. When, when that happens, what happens? Yeah. When, 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 when somebody is well connected mm -hmm. yes. and, and, and stops the law from mm -hmm. taking its course, mm -hmm. what happens? Do? We'll take that after this break. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Stay tuned. Your view will be right back. Thanks for staying with us. So before the break, um, you took us to when there are powerful people involved. Because whether you like it or not, this is, this is Nigeria. You know, somebody knows somebody that knows somebody. So you're saying something that in a situation whereby... Um, owner of a building is highly connected. What happens? How, what does a town planner do in that kind of situation? You see, um, every, 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 every project has a process. Uh, if the town planning office uh, wants to discover uh, a contravention, there is a process to um, reach the property owner. And these are notices that will be served on the owner. Uh, if the owner is present on the site, they served him, basically. But if it's not there, they paste it there, and there will be a picture, so that there will be an evidence that uh, uh, the notice was served. But like I said, Nigerian factor, mm. we like to cut corners. We mm. like to uh, bribe our ways uh, and see things done legally. So it is not uncommon to see uh, situations like that whereby the developer will refuse to respond to contravention notices served on him. Okay, so um, sadly, in this case, the owner of the company that was building passed on in that building. However, the investigation is going to go on to, call, to find out what caused it. Already, um, there's been a bit of disciplinary action in that the GM of Lagos State Building Control Agency was suspended. Um, some said it's a way of easing him out. Um, um, in a, easy easing him out, yeah, in an easy way. But apart from the Building Control Agency, there is also material testing. And there is also town planning. There are many agencies involved that are supposed to have been conducting regular checks on that building to ascertain the quality of material used to give approval for each level. What are we hoping to achieve with this investigation? Are they going to pen down everyone who signed on any approval letter on that building? Are they going to be penalized? What will be the punishment meted out to? Because other people that are involved were also culpable in these 44 lives that we've mm -hmm. lost so far. What will be the punishment meted out to these people whose table papers were placed, whose mm -hmm. tests were supposed to carry those tests, and what kind of justice can be given to the families who lost their lives now? I just gave an example the other time that um, when the licensing office gives someone a license to drive, mm. that does not say that the, the driver should go and drive recklessly because when he was doing the test, he passed. He passed. Mm. So when town planning authority was looking at the document submitted by a developer, I don't want to refer to this one. Mm. Generally speaking, when a developer wants to develop a building, 
you have some documents that you present to the appropriate uh, urban planning office. This includes your architectural drawing, the structural drawing, the soil test reports, mm. all other documents requested. And they will look at them critically. Like I told you, it's not only town planner that is in the town planning office. So mm. the engineer in the town planning office will look at the engineering details. The architect will look at the uh, architectural details. The quantity surveyor will look at it. The land surveyor, all of them come together, they look at it. But it is the, because it is the town planning office, and the head of a town planning office is a town planner, is the one that will give the approval. final approval. approval. So that's why you will see the name of the approving town planning officer on the building plan. So if he approves, he did not approve from town planning point of view mm. or experience or professional skill. He will have looked, they, all of them will have looked at the uh, the, the plan in details mm. before the approval is granted. So it's a process mm. and it takes time. It's not just something that uh, right. they will do in a haste. Let me, so let me... when you look at it like that and town planning grants approval, it is also uh, uh, something that does not stop there. Mm. As you said, there is a con building control agency that mm. monitors it keeps monitoring. monitoring the development okay. to ensure that it complies with the approval granted. I have a call in holding for a while. Lekki from Lekki. Good morning. Are you there? Good morning. Good morning. Here. You're live. Go ahead, please. <laughs> I wanted to contribute. Hello. We I can, can hear you, you madam. I'm here. I'm at Lucky. Yes, listen to the TV. Okay, no, listen you. to me, not the TV. Go Am ahead. In my clothes. In my clothes. I'm in clothes. Yes. Hello. Oh. Hello, madam. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, so listen to me, not the TV. Go ahead, please. Okay. Exclude. Yes, yes. Oh, she's listening to the TV. Let's leave her. She'll, she'll just... Uh, Go ahead, madam. Hello, madam. Oh, I really wanted to hear her. I'm so sorry about that. I guess we lost the line. Okay, we have to wrap up with you um, on this, but I, I guess the, the, my final question to you is, I think just to link up to what Tok was saying, at the end of the day, we hope that there will be people will be persecuted mm. at some point, yes. Yeah. So once we see all the levels of approvals, they were given or not given, should be. and uh, we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. But what, as, as, an, as a professional in this regard, what are your final expectations from the committee, and what would we in four, do you think in four weeks is even enough? to get the answers to this question that we require? Yes, uh, like I said earlier on, that uh, the committee comprises of experienced professionals uh, that uh, were carefully selected to uh, do the investigation and submit their report to the government. I want to believe that um, this that had happened will reduce the incident of building <coughs> collapse in, in Lagos and even in Nigeria in general because I'm very sure, uh, looking at the uh, caliber of people, especially my uh, national president being the chairman of that investigative panel, I want to believe that um, by, the, by the time the committee submits its report, right. uh, it, will, it will bring sanity mm. to building industry and construction. For, what, for, for whatever it's worth, we, we had the privilege of talking to somebody who has worked with Mr. Tonya in the, in the past and said that <coughs> he can vouch for him that he's an incorruptible man. So we... we, 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 we we will wait to see mm. the outcome of this Details. committee because with the Tony um, Ayede chairing it, we mm. hope that the truth will, will come emerge out, yeah. and we we'll know, know exactly what happens. I can assure you that, that the committee will come out with uh, okay. good reports. That is all we can take on this segment. When we come back, move on to other topics. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Your view will be right back. Thanks for staying with us. So join us on the show right now is the Vice Chancellor, University of Lagos Unilag, Professor Ulua Toyin Ugundikwe. He'll be speaking on the tertiary education in Nigeria, University of Lagos as a whole, and, um, and other things. You, uh, you can join the conversation on 081-270-53687-091-390-76948. You can also send us messages on YouTube and Facebook. We'll be happy to read your tweets. Right, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you very much. 
I know your your tenure ends next year, and uh, <laughs> and you you've um, you've had quite an interesting tenure as a vice chancellor. Um, let's start with the high points of your career. I would say, what are those things you think was um, one those major highlights of your career as a vice chancellor, and what are those major achievements you think you're able to um, do achieve in this the past few years? Oh, thank you very much. Um, Concerning my career, I'm a botanist. I got my PhD, botany from the Obafemi Aolawa University, formerly University of Ife. And to the glory of God, I did my PhD within two and a half years in Obafemi Aolawa University. And that will be the first time in University of Ife, Obafemi Aolawa University, that somebody will do a PhD within two and a half years. And from there, I moved to the University of Lagos, um, um, instead of being appointed as a lecturer two, I was given appointment as a lecturer one because of my academic um, exposure. And um, I started working in University of uh, Lagos from April 16, 1990. And from that time till now, I've been able to graduate 19 PhD students in different areas, even with my colleagues in the mm -hmm. Faculty of um, Engineering. And I've been able to attract research grant of over 200 million. And uh, with my other colleagues in um, other parts of the world, we have been able to attract research grant of $2 million. And recently, this year, I just got a research grant of 38,000 euro. Mm. And one of my mentees got a research grant of um, 18,000 uh, 18, euro. So in the area of my profession, to the glory of God, I think um, I've done well. And um, when it comes to the issue of mentoring, I've mentored so many people outside my department. Like I said, I'm a botanist. Um, when you talk about administration, I was um, the head of department of botany and microbiology from 2000 to 2007. Then I was sub dean of the Faculty of Science from 1998 to the year 2000. And um, to the glory of God, I was the first person at the age of 40 to be the chairman of the Chapel of Christ Our Light right. in the University of Lagos. And um, before that time, people who are professors um, have always been the chairperson right. of um, the place. So when it comes to the issue of the University of Lagos... Um, we'll come I'll, to that, don't worry. We right. want to just know about you. But, but yeah. Let me come so, to um, one of, in one of your achievements, I'm happy that you mentioned um, the number of grants you've been able to pull into the university system to do research. One of the biggest problems that I have with the educational sector in Nigeria is that our professors, there's a gap in that we're not seeing the solutions your research is providing for the societal challenges. Um, the idea is when you become a professor, you solve, you, your research is to solve a problem. We see people that will say, the past 10 years I've been working on this, now I have this, this cup is going to solve the problem. Inside this cup there's going to be water and the water will now become oil or something. Um, the grants being gotten, so far, how well would you, is there any, you know, you've mentioned the grants. Can you tell us now the problems that the research have solved for our society and how those, um, the research, as, the solutions that are provided in the results, the results that we now get from the research that has been done? Well, let me pick one of my <laughs> research, <laughs> one of my research um, works, um, that is in the area of palynology, mm. um, where we study pollen grains the sixth geopolitical zone of the country. It was funded by a TED fund. And uh, you know, during certain time of the year, people mm. start sneezing. Right. Mm. The reason is because of the quantity of pollen mm. grains in the atmosphere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In UK, they will call it a fever. Mm. Or here, they can say that it's a spiritual thing. It's not a spiritual thing. It's about the amount of pollen right. grains in the atmosphere. So we have concluded that part of the research work we are now migrating to the other part, which is um, clinical trial, which is the medical area. I'm not a medical person. So we are now bringing in the medical people to now assist concerning what those people who are reacting to pollen grains need to do, apart from using um, drugs. So that's the area we are going into now. When you talk about research work not being um, applicable or not being useful in the country, it's not that it's not useful. A researcher is to do the research work. Mm. In other parts of the world, what they do is that the companies, they invest into research. Mm. 
in the university. I don't want to mention a name of a company in Nigeria that I know that in the University of Reading that I went to, the biggest laboratory was funded by that company, um, mother company in that country. Mm. So let Nigeria our company, company funded a laboratory. No, their mother company okay. is mm. in that place. Okay, okay. So let our companies invest into research work in Nigeria. Let them say, look, University of Lagos or University of Ibadan, mm. we are interested in this particular area. We are investing into it. Whatever comes out of it, we'll take it from you. And they will be the one that will now scale it up. Mm. It is not for the university to now say they want to scale it up. Ours is to maybe to go to the extent of patenting. Mm -hmm. Once you patent, let me give you another example. You talk about ventilator. I make bold to say that in the University of Lagos, we have been able to develop ventilator now, sponsored by Lagos State Science Research and Innovation Council, which the governor of Lagos State is seriously interested in. What we are doing now is to do the clinical run. See, you have been able to develop the ventilator. How can it be used so that in such a way that it will, it will, it will meet the need, there will not be any clinical accident? That mm -hmm. is what we are doing now. Okay. And the solar panel that we have been able to develop in the University of Lagos is friendly. You can use it anywhere. It's solar panel driven. Mm. So mm. You, the, the Lagos, I cannot speak much to you because right. um, Lagos State Government is um, Okay, great. Okay, Prof, I like the fact that you took us to companies uh, investing in research. But what sort of conversations do you have with these companies? I know that if you come to the school environment, there are a lot of companies who have set up, you know, uh, right. their smaller um, organization, either it's the banks or the small businesses. Do you have conversations with them? Who drives that conversation? Because they wouldn't want to just spend money like that till somebody drives that conversation. So is there any plan that academia has to start having conversations with the company, so that they know their responsibilities and assist in research. When you go to Nigerian universities, the only organization you will see are banks. Mm -hmm. They are companies. Too. They are companies, yeah, they are companies. But what investment do they have in that university, apart from setting up the banks? What investment do they have in research, apart from setting up the banks? We want the companies. I don't want to mention, come to, come to the University of Lagos and tell us we want a space, not a bungalow. We want a space. Give us a space in the University of Lagos, like a studio or something like that, that we want to be able to interact with the student. We want to interact with the staff. I want to assure you that if we have any company like that today, I am ready to provide that space. But, sir... What I'm seeing here is everybody is sitting down waiting for somebody to make the first move. If you take it upon yourself as the academia to say, for you to operate here, these are some of the things that the school needs that you will provide for us. And then in turn, we will give you people who will do this. Let me give you an example. Okay. So what I think um, Professor Akanimbo had said in the past is where, as an academia, for example, you approach maybe a bottling company that mm -hmm. handles maybe soft drinks. and say, okay, listen, we will provide you the people. This is every, every year... We're going to be having, uh, of course, there's internship. Mm. But there are ways, there's a ready market that you can provide for these industries. So not just for one company, but across board. So mm. we're saying have a proper engagement with companies across where they know that okay, every year I'm getting X amount of people from the universities into this um, sector. Is, is that conversation it, it, ongoing? Yes, it's ongoing. But you have to look at it that the, most of the companies are coming out of this issue of COVID. Oh, okay. For now, we okay. started it in 2019. Mm. Okay. I'm meeting with the companies, and um, it was the pro we were making progress until 2020 when this issue of COVID-19 COVID. came in. I know some of them are still trying to um, struggle mm. to survive. I want to assure you that um, 2022, we are going to make sure will follow it up this time mm. around. Okay, I'm sir. sure most of the companies will have come out of that um, problem. Okay, sir. So, Thank um, you. Do you like the papers for during COVID for going virtual, shutting down hostels and all of those things that happened there? What exactly and how exactly did you deal with COVID and the breakdown of COVID within the hostels? And now how has this affected the academic year? Now we know that the issue of COVID is a global issue. It's a global okay. problem. What we did then was to shut down the university based on the directive from our principal, and that is the federal government. And um, when the 
directed that we should resume school, we went virtual. I always tell people one thing, what other universities can do and get away with, University of Lagos cannot do, attempt to do it. <laughs> I'll give you one example. There was a university in this country that because the vice chancellor found out that the non-teaching staff were on strike, I knew that the following day they are going to shut the gate. He went to remove the gate overnight. <laughs> you can't do that in the University of Lagos. Mm. So many people will talk about it. So we went virtual for the, because there are about three or two weeks to starting <laughs> the exams. So we went virtual to conclude the semester. And then the year one, year two students, they did their exams online. We took a step by saying that all the year one, year two students, we are giving them free data. Mm. The university spent 18 million naira on that. To do that. On that, wow. yes, because we have to pay Airtel, MTN, all the providers that we did. But when we now, we now said the year three and above should come in person for their exams. You know, the number is not as much as mm. year one, year two. Then, when we started this, um, the second semester, the second semester, we said the students should come um, to campus. But along the line, the, they did the rapid test for about, um, about 10 of them. Ten of the students, only for the students who now went online, saying that the management is trying to cover up some of the students that um, tested positive. But you cannot use the rapid test to confirm the uh, issue of COVID. You need to do the PCR. But, so we need to be very careful so that at the end of the day, we, don't, uh, we are not on the wrong side of the government. Mm. We now decided and said, look, let the student go home. And from there, and it was about Salah holiday which definitely we are going to have the, the, the semester mm. break. So they went home, and after some time, we continue our lectures virtual, continue it virtual. Right. Then we call them back to uh, do the exams, and that we have concluded. We are getting ready for the new so session. So let me, let me let you talk, talk about the, the perception that the, the kind of youngsters we're churning out in the universities are not uh, employable, they're not marketable, and they can't really be engaged. Okay. And people who come with this perspective and they generalize saying that the Nigerian, every, the product of Nigerian universities cannot be employed. I'd like you to speak to that. Is it true that these youngsters cannot be employed or is it true that we're still teaching them archaic syllabus and curriculum? <laughs> well, I would say that whatever you have in the university is a product of what you have produced from the secondary school. Mm. That's number one. Yeah. Number two, these students that you are saying that they are not good, they travel out of the country to do their masters. And they are doing well. Very, they are doing very well, very well. I know of somebody who got top class from our university, went to Canada, and did very well, and is doing his PhD now. My own son finished from the University of Lagos, went to the US for 18 months program, and within that 18 months, by the time he was to graduate, he got two master's degree. So that is one side. The other side is about the companies doing what they are supposed to do. I want to say that in the past, when the student graduated from the university, he want to join a company like Cadbury. Cadbury will do their training for those students before they finally employ them. Shell will do their own training for them. Other companies will do the training for the, them before they now get fitted into the company. But what we have now is that we want um, a dress that is fitted for everybody. Like I said, the carryover of what you have in the secondary school is reflected in the university. Mm. That one is there. It is not all the students getting out of Nigerian universities that are not doing well. Mm. It is not all of them. Okay, let me go on a quick break. When we come back, we continue this conversation with our guests. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Your view will be right back. Thanks for staying with us. So before the break, Nima had a question. Go ahead, please. Because you, you made, made allusions to a third class student who went abroad and made it easy. I believe that that's an issue of our curriculum or our style of educating. Most of our students that we condemn here 
as poor students, when they go abroad, I don't know how the system is there, they begin to excel. Mm. So what are the problems that, you know, the styles of our education that we should change? Or lecturer student approach, or lecturer student relationship that must be changed. Mm. Also, a student of Unilag that I know personally wanted to get her transcript to make an admission um, in Canada. And she, no, in the US, sorry, she missed that admission because of the delay of some of these things and requiring connection. How easy is it to get your transcript from Unilag? Well, um, let, it, let me take it from the first part of it concerning the student exposure in Nigeria. Um, I want to be frank by saying that our environment is hostile. Mm. And our students are coming from um, a very hostile environment, going to a place where everything needed um, is available. Definitely, you know, they will excel. I'll give you an example of myself. Before I finished my PhD, I never saw an electron microscope. But I read so much about the electron microscope. Mm. Uh, the first, my first encounter with electron microscope was when I went out for my postdoctoral. And, um, in the um, University of Reading and Cambridge, and I saw electron microscope. And the person taking me through was surprised that within one week, I was able to manipulate the electron <laughs> microscope. Unlike having it for, many of them will be on it for about three months before they come and Within one week, I was able to manipulate it. So you are coming from an environment that is hostile um, to an environment where everything you need um, is available. There it's there for you. The opportunities are there for you, the exposure there for you. So that's the difference that I can say in that area. The issue of transcript has been, a very, has been a big problem in the past, but it's better now. Part of the problems that we have concerning transcript uh, are, pe are people that want to change their date of birth. Uh, maybe they are going to Canada. Um, they don't want to go to Canada, and um, the date they put in the form is different from the one they used when they were in the university. You cannot change your date of birth. Mm. once you are out of the university. Maybe you can change it when you are still there to prove that uh, you have um, the correct date of birth through affidavit and things like that. But once you are out of the university, that's you it. Cannot, that's it. Mm. That's right, it. So that's call. the problem we have. Well, this how they call us and hold it for a while. Good morning. Are you still there? Sorry for keeping you. Hello? Hi, good morning. I'm so sorry. Go ahead, please. All right. Um, so some quick feedback for the, for the talk. Um, my name is Joe Wakinde. Um, first thing, good work that you're doing with Unilag. Um, even though, as far as I'm concerned, uh, there are only two schools in Nigeria, the University of Ibadan and the others, but hey, good work with Unilag. Yes, we know. <laughs> Secondly, um, I'd like to touch on the issue of corporate sponsorship that you mentioned you know, uh, uh, earlier. Uh, and I'd like to come at it from the angle of ownership. I got the sense from your, from your position that uh, much of the initiative, much of the onus is, 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 is being placed on the corporate sponsor side. And you're expecting, for instance, the banks, for instance, the corporate organizations, to have the initiative to think about what it will benefit them and to come and start to rule the university. I think it's the other way around. Um, if I can tap into one academic theory that I learned called the theory of change that says there is no human being that will never make a change until the cost of change is less than the cost of staying the same. If the management of your school, for instance, Unilag or any other university, can, um, what's the word, enumerate and articulate the specific benefits that communicate to the corporate organization while investing in their university is for their own selfish interest, mm. I can assure you that by tomorrow or by next semester, sir, you have more requests and more attention than you can handle. Thank you very much, Thank Joe, you. for that, sharing that. Um, I cannot but touch on the fact that there was an allegation of misappropriation against you some, some time back, and I know you've been cleared of that. But as the vice chancellor, I mean, this is something you say before we come to the territory, how you, you have access to so much funds. How did you manage that entire experience, one, and number two? 
how best do we ensure that whoever becomes VC, whoever, I mean, takes over from you eventually, there's no issue of possible allegation again in future? How do we ensure that proper checks and monies are come, are come, monies are coming are properly spent and there are not any issues going forward? Uh, thank you very much for that question. I want to say that the university system is a unique system. The university operates on committee system. I cannot approve anything. i give you an example. I travel to Abuja now. I cannot just raise a memo that I want a refund. And when I even get the memo from my office that they will write that to the, to the VC, approve your trip to Abuja, I will need to now send it to a BOSA, approve. Sending it to BOSA does not mean BOSA will approve payment immediately. Mm. BOSA will mean it to the deputy BOSA, who is in charge of um, the, 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 mm -hmm. the budget, mm -hmm. to know if there is fund for, this. for that. Mm. So I cannot just approve, say approve. No, university does not operate like that. But like I said, at the right time, I will respond to... So you don't have thought all these people without to be doing committee, committee. So <laughs> you thought out, because everywhere with National Assembly, it's not committee to review the committee that reviewed the committee yeah. last week. So it was from you guys. From the university, university operate on committee system. Mm. Ah. Yes, there's Talk nobody in the... There's no VC in the university that will just approve payment. That, that can mm. take money without the permission of all yeah. the members of the committee. Mm. It's not possible. Mm. But... Except we've seen that, the together. truth is that we've seen that... I said the if, compromise. If yeah. No individual, no corruption cannot be successfully carried out as, as an individual. There is a committee involved in corruption. It's, a, it's always a unit. And what, we, what we've said, and we've, because we've seen it, is that when it comes to money sharing, they don't quarrel, we don't hear you are from Nigeria, you are from Benin. No, 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 no. Your village is actually in Nigeria. If they trace your lineage, it's always, when it's money sharing, it's easy. There is a problem that has been incessant with the university structure. Funding, ASU will come out, then SANU will come out. Mm -hmm. Then there is consistent strike action over and over again. From your opinion, where is the problem in the university? What is the real problem? Coco of the matter. The, the real problem is that the university and the government should work together. ASU, as a union who is interested in the welfare of its people, should know that when they negotiate with the government, there is need, need for advocacy mm. for government to implement what they have agreed on. Then for the university system, let me give you another example. Do you know that between January and October, the electricity bill for University of Lagos is 1.0296 billion. Mm. Why? It means that our electricity bill on the average per day is 100 million. I mean, per, per, per month, 100 million. So that is being paid from our IGR, mm. Mm. from the money, the fund generated from the university, 1.0296 billion naira. But thank God that recently we got a relief from the Federal Minister of Education saying that we'll go through the Niger Delta um, development and power generating so that we'll be able to pay less. Instead of 56 or 54 per unit, we'll now come to maybe 35 or 40 per unit. That will reduce our but bills. How about generating yourself? How about your engineers coming up with a solution to generate power within the university for university use alone? Thank yes. you. People always talk about that. Yeah. Let me take the issue of wind. The speed of the wind we have by our lagoon front cannot power, cannot provide enough power that you need. Okay. Mm. The lagoon is not a river. Mm. If it is a river, you can easily dam it. Mm. So lagoon is more, I mean, more or less stationary. Mm. The wind speed you get from it cannot power your energy. Mm. The one that we are looking at is so the lagoon. issue of the, the, the issue of solar, you see, this, the, the issue of solar is another angle. Mm. It's expensive. Mm. So we are looking for investors that will now come into it and say, look, we are going to invest into this, invest into the solar one. Mm. We are looking at the one of turning waste to power. Mm -hmm. okay. We are working on that too. Okay. Yeah. We have done it on the micro level. But we want to now do it on the market. Well, going back to what the government is doing, so you have one point something billion within 10 months. I now, I would think that the government should give you waivers, should give you some kind of a, not just this 36 naira kind of discount, but there should be some kind of a serious um, 
um, um, it's cut. It's management. You know, for, for, from government to you, because your university system, isn't that covered in the... Uh, how how so does the that government work? Governments have money for that. I believe that would be the best thing for the university to... They can say that maybe the university should pay 40% mm. of the tariff. Right. That will make it better. Alaji has been holding for a while. Come to you, Nima. Let me take Alaji Zubra. Alaji Zubra, are you there? Yes, I'm here. You're live. Go ahead, please. I've been holding on I'm so sorry, sir. Go ahead, sir. Okay. All right, all right. Good morning, VC. Good morning, sir. You see? Yes, sir. Please, I just want to... A clarification a clarification on the student hostel in Unilag. Unilag, we all know that it's one of the oldest universities. And by virtue of Unilag, which everybody, you know, healthy, we, 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 we even thought Unilag is supposed not to be facing that kind of problem of accommodation for the student. Mm -hmm. And by, 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 by what we know, Unilag has a lot of, uh, you know, uh, wide area, you know, land, which I, I believe for the number of years the Unilag has been in the system. They're supposed to have expanded their, 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 you know, the, 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 the availability of uh, all services for the students. And up to now, you know, you know, the students are still facing this problem of hotel. It's so terrible. So I just want a clarification for the Thank you, sir. And Fantastic question. Yes, sir. Well, that's a good question. The student population of uh, Unilag for undergraduate, postgraduate, and um, part-time students um, is above 57,000. Wow. Now, the student population for our undergraduate student is above 30,000. We can only accommodate barely 8,000. Mm. Accommodate 8,000. And when you talk about 8,000, let me put it here before us, that when you give accommodation to four students, definitely it's eight. It's eight. And the eight, there are some people that will just come in, sleep That's one sports. hour, and go. We have to factor that one in. The money you will use in putting up hostels in University of Lagos is more than the money you will use in putting up hostels in other universities. Because if you look at University of Lagos, it's waterlogged. Oh. It's waterlogged. So people that want to invest, mm. Looking at our own act, the University of Lagos Act says that you can only allow somebody to undo the project or the, 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 the project for 21 years. So who, after investing so much into construction of a building, and you know that within 21 years, with the, you, the, the you, you, get, you give it back to the school, and you will not be able to get your, your money, money back wow. within that 21 years. Can that act so, be changed? That's what we are working on now, okay. to, so that we can work on that act. Aside from that, um, in the next one year, um, in the next six months, let me put in the next six months, by the grace of God, with this council that we have, chaired by Prince Teju Osho, we have people that have shown interest now that want to invest into our um, hostel facility. So we are working on that. We have so many. In the past, we have done it before. I will give it to investors. They collected the paper, they went away. But this time, we have people who have shown serious interest. interest. And I want to assure you, the next maximum six months, right. we'll come out okay. with that. And we'll, we'll be, be expectant. To yes. Quickly, I wanted to disagree with you on the power issue. I think that Unilag can solve that problem internally. from student research internally. I know that some of your graduates are already doing amazingly creative. Even to add to that, Nima, sorry, Henri Buwale, uh, Raji. Mm -hmm. Um, her, her member House of was saying that in the 70s, you didn't like used to generate electricity yeah, power. back then. Power. So what so happened to it? I want to believe that it can be done. Also, Unilag pulled out of ASU in the past, and they successfully sustained their university based on their IGR. What happened to that? That's two questions. Well, want. let me tell you that um, Unilag never pulled out of ASU. Not one. There was a time... I have been, I have been, I have been in the University of Lagos since 1990. Mm -hmm. Maybe before I came in. But let me give you another side of the story. Okay. That even when they are to agree on this um, law that led to setting up of Ted Fund, mm. it was in Unilag that they had that meeting. So the best of, I know that Unilag was only suspended for about six months or thereabouts. 
and they reabsorb us. So for, Unilag was never... For quite a while, Unilag did not join ASU Strike. Oh. For... If Unilag had mm. never joined ASU Strike, mm. then why was it that we don't meet our academic calendar? Mm. Yes. You I see, people, people jo I have been in University of Lagos. During Omoto last time, they will tell you that Unilag never joined ASU. That is not true. Okay. The only thing we do in Unilag, I make bold to say that our ASU in Unilag, they think globally and they act locally. Then the issue of power, Unilag at never generates its own power. Even in the 70s? No, no, no. What they did then was to have something like a, um, something that they got from Egbe. If you mm -hmm. go there now, you will see it like a turbine which they use in the laboratory to see if they can generate power, mm. is there now. Unilag never generated its own power. They attempted to see if they can generate power. Mm. But to scale it up, like I told you, we have done it at the micro level. To scale it up requires a lot of money. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So I'm happy that you people are looking at waste all over the world. Waste is being used now, and um, I pray that you hurry up in that regard. <laughs> but let me take you back a little to the curriculum. How up dating is this curriculum? How um, do you combine or you compare How the curriculum with best practices outside mm -hmm. the country so that students who come out of Unilag are able to solve problems? Well, what we, uh, we have just set up um, a committee now um, by Senate that they want to review our curriculum. Okay. And definitely we are bringing in not just the professional bodies, we are bringing in companies mm. into that committee so that it should be something that will be town and town oriented, not just uh, book, Theory. book, like you said, book, book. No, not only going to be book, book. We we'll bring them in. And with that, I want to assure you. Because if you look at our um, Unilag Business School now, we have people from outside mm. who are in that space. If you look our, at our entrepreneurship center, we have people from outside. Real entrepreneurs. Real entrepreneurs. Mm. They just finished a program mm. now who are in so what this administration is doing right. is mixing, bringing town and gown together. Okay. So awesome. the few things you've said today will be holding you up to it. I know we'll the next year is your final year, but we'll be making sure that it is done. But well, thank you very much for joining us this morning, thank sir. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. We'll be speaking with the Vice Chancellor of Unilac, Professor Ogundipe. That's all we can take on the show today. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye for now.